Thanks for tuning in to your day off podcast, hosted by your boys, Corey and Tony. I think by the end of today, I might have another best friend. They're committed to making you fall in love with the hair industry, one podcast at a time. Uh, you're going to grab a lot of information. Yeah, you're going to learn a lot. Presented by Hair Industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this is it. Your day off podcast will begin after a word from our sponsors. Of course, I'm sitting with my best friend Tony. What's up, bud? What's going on, homie? Nothing, man. I'm excited about our guest today. We uh, we actually met at Premiere Orlando. Um, kind of in the hair world. Well, kind of important to the hair world, I would guess, but not really in the hair world. Yeah, yeah. He uh he definitely caters to our industry. Oh, there's no doubt about it. I'm I'm excited to talk to him. Not only am I excited to talk to him just about what he's doing and how uh, how he's helping uh helping out the hair industry, at least aesthetically. Um, but, uh, but kind of his journey of, of, of getting here. And, um, I know at least actually I'll ask you a question. Cause I know like on my, uh, on my Instagram and it's like his company is advertised all over my Instagram. Like even, I, I, I knew well, bef- I knew a lot about this company well before I met our guest today. Yeah. And it's funny. Cause when you, when you finally met this guy in, in, and you know, you say, Hey, I want to do a podcast with this guy. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I could tell you're excited. So I, I had to check it out and now I'm excited because he's, he's done things that we've been a fan of and, and curious about a long time. So now we're going to get the answers, right? Yeah. yeah. That's, should we get in? Let's do it. So uh, our guest today is Mr. Oliver Zach. Oliver is the uh, co-founder or founder of mad rabbit tattoo cream. Um, Oliver, is that what you call it? Yeah, I mean, we're Mad Rabbit these days. It was definitely launched as Mad Rabbit Tattoo Cream, and um, yeah, we've That's evolved cool. a little bit. That's awesome. So that voice you hear again is is Oliver Zach. Um, he's with Mad Rabbit. We have so many questions. Um, if you've ever watched Shark Tank, they were on Shark Tank. They participated in Shark Tank, and um, they got to uh, they got they actually got picked up by one of the sharks. So um, I'm also curious about that relationship and all that. So we're we'll get into all that, and then um, Oliver, listen. Uh, Oliver's in the hair business to, or in the hair industry to to uh, to stay a little um, at the uh, at the hair shows. But uh, uh, Oliver, dude, w- welcome to your day off. Thank you guys for having me. I'm absolutely stoked to be here. Um, I, as you mentioned, I think there's a ton of overlap with tattoos and the barber and hair world. So I'm excited to unpack that. So uh, uh, Premiere was your first hair show, right? It was. Yeah. Were you pretty surprised at how many tatted barbers and hairdressers there were? Yeah, I was surprised for a lot of reasons. I had been to tattoo conventions, obviously, and you have some um, some head turners in terms of people watching for sure. But the hair world has its own uh, little subsect of, of head turners. It's pretty funny. There's a lot of self-expression. Um, and I was really surprised by the amount of, of love and openness that we were met with, uh, despite not being a hair product. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think hairdressers care that much. You know, I think that, you know, I mean, I think our <laughs> podcast kind of proves that is like it's like how can. How, how does it bring value to to the industry? And and like I I, I kind of kid it like opening up like you know you're bringing an aesthetic which we obviously all care about. We're we're all in the aesthetic kind of um industry, you know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, tons of hairdressers have tattoos. Tons of clients have tattoos. So it's oftentimes common ground in in the in the chair for conversation. I've found. Absolutely, and you you mentioned like a lot of clients have it have. Are you catering to salons or, or suites as to be able to carry the product as well? Yeah, so our wholesale is interesting. Um, I say wholesale, I mean fragmented channels. So that's tattoo salons, or sorry, tattoo shops, hair salons, barber shops, uh, increasingly so permanent makeup studios. Um, there's a variety of shelves that I think Mad Rabbit can fit on. Um, and we're really starting to figure out how to work our way into the hair industry because uh you know the hairdresser has their client for 45 minutes to three hours and like i said tattoos are probably going to come up in conversation if they both have them so it makes sense to sell it there for sure were you surprised that were you surprised at how little tattoos there were meaning like finding people without tattoos at a hair show is damn near impossible yeah it's really hard it's like a it's a needle in a haystack for sure it's kind of like that red car thing. Like when you buy your first red car, you start noticing how many are actually on the road. Um, I found tattoos to be very similar for me when I got my first couple. 
it was amazing. Like, um, I'm 54 and uh, uh, Tony's 54 as well. Um, but it's amazing how, like, when, when I got my first tattoo when I was 18, how, like, it was like almost nobody had tattoos, you know? Like, like I remember, like, the first time, I guess I, I'm so going to get murdered for this, but it's okay. I remember being, like, 19 and even seeing just a girl with a tattoo going, like, oh, my gosh, that girl has a tattoo. Not with any judgment, but just, like, like shocked that I saw it. And now, like... Obviously, that's not shocking at all anymore. That's funny because my first tattoo, I think I was the only one in school with 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 my tattoo. It was in middle school. <laughs> I was four. Oh, that's hardcore. My what? Well, not really. Uh, I can't wait this story. My yeah. So my uh, my uncle, he was in a, a motorcycle gang, right? So they uh, were. I, I was at my cousin's house. They, they were having this biker party, and everybody's lit. I mean, smoking green, getting drunk, and giving jailhouse jailhouse tattoos to each other. And one of the Drunk guys were like, hey, y'all boys want some tattoos? Get over here. And it, I'm sitting down. I think I'm 14. I'm cool. And he puts this kind of supposed to be like a Harley Davidson type bird, like the logo. And it ended up looking like kind of roadkill. And uh, my mom had a fit, but it was so big. It covered my whole arm pretty much. <laughs> I'm I'm 13, 14 years old. I got this big old roadkill tattoo. Dude, that tattoo looked like you got hit by the windshield. Oh my god! Yeah, the Harley Davidson eagle, like in a windshield. It was like all spread out and splattered. Uh, that's Americana, man. That's what that's what carried the tattoo industry for decades. Was those kind of tattoos? Yeah, that's awesome. Oh, for sure. <laughs> I, you know what though? Like like tattoos is kind of like a badge of honor. Like if I see somebody that like has a single needle like jailhouse tattoo, I don't mess with that dude. <laughs> <laughs> I mean I don't mess with any dude, let's be right. clear. But but you know, it's kind of like the cauliflower ear, you know, it's like I ain't messing totally. with Totally. Yeah. They they call it a gulag chic these days. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Oh so, my god. So what prompted this idea of Mad Rabbit? Yeah. Um I, I'm not like heavily covered in tattoos. I have like a few small fine line ones. Um, I think I had three at the time of actually coming up with the idea of Mad Rabbit. But basically, I was really frustrated that there were no clean or vegan alternatives to petroleum jelly for tattoo healing, let alone tattoo skin care go forward. So um, it was kind of off that pain point that Mad Rabbit was founded as a side hustle in college with my partner, Salam. Um, we ran it for a year before we graduated. And graduated on to full-time jobs. So I say that because I, I don't think the expectation of, of success was really there. Um, we knew we were doing really well and we knew that we had achieved product market fit. We knew that, you know, tattooed people were finding us on Instagram and Facebook and, and seeing a need for our products. Um, but it wasn't until Shark Tank and until we really started expanding our, our product offering that we achieved what I call brand market fit. Um, and that's where your customer resonates with a variety of your products across the line and continually comes back as you launch new products. Um, a lot of our success was, was definitely due to the, the Shark Tank episode airing in March of 2021. Um, that was still when people were all locked up in COVID and on their phones and purchasing online. So in a weird way, you know, COVID was, was a blessing for the founding of Mad Rabbit. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful for that, but I'm way more excited to be operating full time now because now we have the chance to attend in-person events like Premier Orlando and uh, we get to enter the hair industry and be a presence in person. So um, it's changed a lot since the days of it being a, a side hustle. Um, but I think the message of, of clean and vegan tattoo care has really resonated and um, we're really excited to also expand into professional facing products at this point. So really catering to the tattoo artist. That's amazing. Hey, I got a couple questions real quick. Is, is the first question is how'd you come with the name Mad Rabbit? But then follow that up with like, like, so did you did, right before like you knew that that was gonna the the it was gonna show on TV? Like, were you <laughs> anticipating? And then what was the response? Um, you know, why you were why, you know for that hour that you were on? Yeah. Um. First question. So Mad Rabbit. I, I need some sort of like crazy lie that. I don't know, illustrates me getting gouged by a, a jackalope or something in the West. <laughs> but the the key to Mad Rabbit was I, I wanted it to be something you had to look into to figure out what it is, right? I didn't want it to be Tattoo Boost or Incafy or something corny like that. I really resonate in like brands that uh, stand for something but mean nothing, right? So I look to Red Bull, for example. Um, what is a Red Bull? Doesn't matter. But once you figure out it's an energy drink, that always resonates. Uh, Apple, same thing. Um, so I, I wanted it to be something that kind of seems like nonsense on the surface, but actually has undertones of 
uh, American made and natural. Uh, so that's where we pulled from the jackalope, which is a, a mascot of American folklore, if you will, uh, and, and turned them into the mad rabbit. Was it always mad rabbit? Like from, like from day one, like when you did this, we're going to do mad rabbit. Yeah, it was originally, I'm actually wearing the first shirt we ever made. Um, and it says mad rabbit, all natural tattoo enhancer. So kind of like the, uh, I don't know, like an old West wagon offering, if you will, was, is what we were trying to evoke originally with the brand name. But since then we've, we've slimmed down to mad rabbit. I like that. It's like the old fashioned, like snake oil and stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know what I heard? Actually, this is an interesting conversation. So I, I, I read this article about, about snake oil and apparently there was some medicinal stuff about snake oil, but then what happened is that, is that the Chinese came in and they, 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 they they stole the IP to snake oil and started making crap stuff. So that it's actually the crap stuff that was like, that was IP stealing um, is why we, is why we call it snake oil. But uh, apparently the original snake oil that was sold was uh, actually had medicinal um, properties. Oh, wow. Isn't that crazy? That. Propaganda, man. It'll get it, you. Man. it did. So, so during this will lead up to your second okay. question. Like when you guys, so you developed this mad rabbit and, who had the idea and said, hey, let's apply for Shark Tank. Let's. Yeah, that was actually my co-founder, Salam. Um, I, I grew up watching Shark Tank every single Friday with my families from when I was 13 years old to when I left for college at 18. Um, my dad's an entrepreneur. I knew that it's something I always wanted to be. Um, but I never had the, the balls to get on Shark Tank, if you will, or, or send that application in. My co-founder, Salam, who's notorious for grammatical and spelling errors, um, he half-asked, in his words, an Instagram application for Shark Tank. Uh, I'm sure it was riddled with, with those errors I was referencing, but surprisingly, we ended up getting a call back. And I didn't trust it at first because two months prior, I received a voicemail from who I thought was Post Malone's manager telling me that <laughs> they're excited to work together. And it was, uh, it was Salam pranking me. So I was like, there's no way you're going to get me again. I'm not falling for this again. Um, but then he sent me the voicemail of the casting agent. And I was like, wow, this is, this is legit. So therein starts the pitching process. That was a process of recording and submitting probably 50 iterations of our pitch to this casting agent who, this is very atypical. This guy was dead set on getting us on. He came back with notes every single time need more energy, need to smile more, et cetera. We finally got it right after, I kid you not, like two weeks of trying to pitch this, this camera. Um, and he said it, it, sent it in and we got the, the flights booked to Las Vegas. Cause again, this was during COVID. So they flew us into the bubble instead of Los Angeles. Um, and then we were separated from each other, isolated in our rooms for 10 days. Every meal was delivered. I had a beautiful view of the Venetian pool, but I could not, <laughs> could not get in. Um, I couldn't even go to the gym. Um, so I had nothing to do but practice this pitch over FaceTime with Salam for 10 days straight. Um, we get into the, the big ballroom over the intercom, you hear pitch, and then you walk down the famous Shark Tank aisle and it is like go time. There's one chance at it. You're in there for about an hour um, and it's just a grill session. But luckily for us, uh, I think momentum really played in our favor. We knew our numbers very, very well, and we had confidence in them and our business model. And we ran into very little troublesome questions. I think everyone was really excited to have us there, which was cool. Okay, so many questions now. Hold on. So, so, yes, did, so do the producers? Do the producers? Do they? Um, do they prep you? Like, make sure that you have these numbers and in, in this, like, or. Yeah, go ahead. It's, it's, to me, to me, here's what it looks like. And Tony and I were talking about it right before we got on air. It looks like a TED talk to me. It looks like, you know, because everyone kind of has the same pitch. Everyone kind of has the, mm -hmm. the same thing. And I know we have a couple of friends that have done TED talks. So, you know, there's a whole procedure about this is the way that the message is delivered. Is there none of that coaching? There's uh, I mean, you have the parameters of, of what is your 90 second pitch, right? What does that look like? And that's where you get into kind of like stylistic writing. That's where I drew, uh, correlations between tattoos and uh, masterpieces from art history, for example, that you kind of want to be illustrative and, and flamboyant with that pitch. And then from there, uh, you kind of get into the questions and the Q&A and the digging in. But for that first part, I mean, my, my preparation for writing that with Salam looked a lot like uh, watching the best Shark Tank pitches of all time, quite honestly. Um, Scrub Daddy, for example, is 
one of the best Shark Tank episodes to ever air. He's a fantastic salesman and he crushed it. Um, there were some things I didn't like about, about his intro though. So we kind of just pulled from a variety of pitches. We had the parameters of here's the amount of time you have to speak. And um, a lot of that was also teased out during the application process with the casting agent um, getting feedback like, hey, maybe don't say this, try this instead. A lot of it's pretty hammered out by the time you're walking down the aisle. Wow. Wow. But so, but they don't give you like, you know, make sure you know these numbers, these numbers, they're going to ask these type, type of questions. It's No, and I, I think that's where a lot of people go wrong with Shark Tank. Um, I think it's a good thing for just about every company out there, so long as you're at the point of having confidence in your numbers and your business model. Um, and that's like a step you can't, you can't skip, in my opinion. So um, that wasn't necessarily guidance they provided, but uh, that's just more of like a, a business relations thing, right? Like if, if you're pitching somebody to give you money, you better damn well know how you're going to get it back to them. Right. Mm, that's a good point there. That's really, and, and I guess the producers, they don't care. They don't care if you get picked up or not. And if you stumble, that's even, that's just good TV as well. Right. No. Yeah. Producers want good TV. And and that was the other thing about the casting process where I brought up like energy and, and flamboyancy. Like what they told us is that, 110% energy looks like 70% energy on TV. So they really were kind of pushing for you to become a TV bit for better or for worse. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's yeah. funny. Cause you, you see, you see a lot of people, they'll have a great pitch, but when they start grilling them about the numbers, they were like, uh, they kind of get lost a little bit. And all of a sudden then you get uh, Mr. Wonderful. He's, he starts drilling you and, uh, but so when you, when you guys, when they were asking you these questions and you knew your numbers, uh, did you, could you, could you tell that you started to kind of like, kind of like start to hook them and you, and, and they're starting to kind of like, you know, it was, it was very, very tense until we got our first offer, which was actually from Kevin O'Leary, Mr. Wonderful, which was a huge relief because he knows his shit and he's a business fundamentals guy. So to have his kind of buy-in off the bat, I think was a huge, like, uh, it was a great thing. Um, and, and soon on, that's soon after that's when the other offers piled on. Um, that's when Mark followed up with his offer. Um, Lori was about to make an offer and Mark said, it's me or you walk. And we took Mark because he's who we wanted from the beginning. But, um, yeah, I mean, Kevin really started off a ton of momentum for us that was just continually positive throughout the, the episode. Okay, that, you just brought up another question. So, did you guys talk before uh, Salam? Is that his name? Your yeah, partner? that's right. Did, did you and did did you guys talk before and like okay, like was it real talk or was it like how dope would it be if Mark picks us up? Like, what was the real conversation? What was that conversation like? A and then B. Like, did you guys have a number? Like, okay, if they offer us this, we'll take it. If they offer us this, like, did you guys create like a battle line? Like, we're not going to cross this. We're not going to give up this much. Yeah. Um. So we both knew all the sharks very well um and we also know what they're known for right uh whether it's industry or if it's uh, reaching out to companies that have gotten deals with each of the sharks beforehand we had a lot of those conversations just so we could be prepared to analyze the situation if it came up um in other words like how could we extract the most value from lori if she was the one who ended up giving us a deal for example um we felt best about mark obviously for the sports overlap um, and really just from, from a PR perspective, I think he's the most prominent, um, outside of that, what was the other question you asked? Did you guys, did you guys set up parameters? Like you, so like oh, if yeah. you were to offer, like if, if Mark were to offer X, but one at this much, um, this much, sure. uh, whatever ownership. So one of the, th one of the things prior to going on Shark Tank we did was we raised a friends and family round. So with that comes uh, evaluation. Um, it's, it's what's called a convertible note. So it doesn't necessarily turn into equity until, um, until you raise a, a financing round. But we had a bottom price that we took from our friends and family that we did not want to drop below. I think we went on the show with hoping to, to get a $12 million valuation and we walked out with a $4.2 million valuation. So a massive massive cut on what we were expecting um and then you pair you pair that with the fact that you don't actually get the money until nine months later right when they're deciding whether or not they should air that valuation is very stale if you're if you're a high growth company so i think the way we looked at it is 
listen, this is going to be kind of a kick in the balls for a lack of a better word, but um, it's going to be well worth it from a PR perspective and a, a capitalization perspective. And it absolutely was. I mean, it, it definitely propelled us into becoming a household name. Beyond the show, Mark has invested an additional million dollars with us. Um, so for us, I mean, it was it was a, a fantastic thing. Oh, oh, you just opened up some more questions for me. So so it, you 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 record right? Like you record the episode. So then you said that it, they they decide whether they're going to use it or not. So if they don't use it, is is, is your deal contingent on that? Yeah. Um, so it has to go through it, the TV show. It has to go through the TV show. There are some cases where it doesn't. And in our case, I think Mark had the the trust that if we aired, we wouldn't back out of the deal. Because that, that has happened to the Sharks before. And it's part of the reason why they're kind of averse to not closing the deal prior to it airing. Um, so I think he he trusted us and we therefore followed through on our side of the deal. But I've heard of a lot of cases where it is quite contingent on your airing if you if you accept their deal or not. Um, I don't know the validity of that. And it certainly wasn't our case, but I think it happens. So when, when you, when you guys like done and you shook Mark's hand and nine months goes by and you get the money and, Oh, that must've been crazy. You, <laughs> okay. Obviously you got nine months of planning the future too. So, but are you meeting with, with Mark? Are you talking to Mark? Are you talking to his team? Are you guys kind of like, you know, creating this household brand? together yeah so um one of the first things after we shook his hand and and got off stage um we were introduced to his point person who runs mark cuban companies which is the portfolio of all of his companies and he would then serve as our point of contact for the next few years and still um they were initially on the board for about a year um, and have since rolled off because we've raised additional equity since then and brought new board members on um, but I would say we, we definitely hear from, from Mark and his team, mostly around investment updates, investor updates, uh, board notes and things like that. Really anytime big news about the company or a big decision to be made, um, that's kind of when I'll reach out to him. I'll say the funny thing about Mark Cuban as well, which I, I don't understand how he does it. There must be 11 Mark Cubans at all times, but he has never taken more than five minutes to respond to an email of mine. It's, it's a bit baffling considering how many operating roles he has in so many different companies, let alone companies of his own. Um, he's been extremely responsive and helpful the entire time. That's amazing. Do you, uh, do, do you have a cell digit? Can you text them? I have them. I use them very sparingly. I've only called on it once. <laughs> <laughs> I get that. We, we email, get... email works. So, I mean, why, why change it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. That's so good. So he's, so he's pretty hands on then, right? I wouldn't say hands-on. Um, he's he's more of an advisor, I guess I would call it. And so, like, does okay? So, will he answer questions, or does he kind of come forward and, and go like, "Hey, Oliver, have you thought about this?" Or, or this is an angle that we can play. Or is it always like, or is the conversations more like, "Hey, Mark, I'm struggling here. What should I do?" Uh, I think it's a combination of things, and I think that's what probably makes a good advisor. Um, He'll come to us with with unwarranted advice or on um what's the word? Um on uh, uh not warranted on um on like instigator uh, on uh yeah that yeah, word yeah. um or that whatever that is yeah uh he, he'll come to us with with advice that he you know for example there's a chain of tattoo parlors that have exclusive right to operate on all 27 military bases in the U S they're called American Tattoo Society run by um, Nicole and Ryan Harrell. And he emailed me one day and said, Hey, this, this group of operators reached out to me. I think it'd be a great thing for Mad Rabbit. Here's, here's the intro. And through that introduction, we are now selling in all of American tattoo societies, um, which allows us to cater to an awesome military audience in a way that we weren't before. Um, he'll also, uh, come in if, so if you're familiar with, uh, iOS 14, when that rolled out, it, changed the digital marketing landscape forever. Um, you no longer could tell that that Tony was scrolling on Pinterest for three hours. Facebook could no longer tell that Tony was scrolling on Pinterest for three hours looking at his next tattoo. Uh, so therefore, I can no longer target him as accurately across apps. 
that was a huge moment for brands that they had to figure out what their digital marketing would look like go forward. And that's an example of where we reached out to Mark and said, hey, how can we get away from our dependence on ad spend and, you know, figure out the shift in climate? His recommendation there was for us to start up Mad Rabbit University, which is a boots on the ground uh, college ambassador program that we've started and extracted a lot of value from over the last three semesters. So kind of how he enters the conversation can change, um, but he's very versatile, responsive, and wise, to be quite honest. So he's, he's been a great partner for us from an advisor perspective. Did he, uh, did he mention, um, did he, uh, did, did you ask him about hair shows? I did not. I did not get his opinion on hair shows. I should though. Yeah, yeah, let us know. <laughs> let us know. I would love to know what his opinion on hair shows are. So, so when but when you went on the Shark Tank, you had one product. Now you're expanding on. You have multiple products. Is it yes. is it under with you and your partner to get together and 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 you you consult with Mark's team or or how do you talk about like growing it, growing this brand to multiple products? Mm-hmm. A lot of our innovations have actually come off the back of our community. So we have an extremely active Discord channel with 6,000 ambassadors who are live chatting at any time. Um, we have a million followers across social. And what all of that does is it allows us to tap into our community and really just ask them what they want. Um, it's It's been as simple as that for at least the last three years of, of product development. So, uh, for example, a bar soap was very high on the wish list for our customer knowing that really the only alternative to tattoo healing for bar soap is like dove unnatural or natural unnatural unscented bar soap so we look to iterate on that create an aloe vera based version and come up with a better one for tattoo healing um what our process kind of looks like is those ideas are often sourced from the community we then run the idea by our pro team which as of now it's 11 of in my opinion, the best tattoo artists in the United States um, who have incredible followings and respect in their own right, in their own industry. Um, We run the idea by them. Uh, If approved or they're excited about it, we then move on to product formulation with our chemist. And lastly, the final kind of sign off that we get on all of our products prior to launching is uh, we have an awesome tattooed dermatologist on our advisory board. So he's a skin cancer surgeon by day. Uh, tattoo collector by night and he serves as an awesome voice of, of science on all of our products so that's kind of how we we iterate and expand that's pretty cool i have a request i, yeah, love, I, I love i love i love the body wash that, that you guys have um uh-huh. i kind of wish it had like a vanilla tobacco kind of like a, a like fragrance to it like you've uh, gotten that feedback a ton that it's it's uh probably leans a little more feminine which is kind of interesting because it's a masculine to me, it's bottle. Just, to me it's just neutral Right. It's a, it's just like kind of a, kind of a neutral sp- um, smell as far as like as far as if we're putting gender on it. But like I would love. But yes, to that, I would love like this, like masculine kind of like like smell. I'm tar and wood and yes. tire. <laughs> <laughs> like, like we've been in the woods all, all weekend. But neutral, yes. you can hit everybody unless you're going to do. Uh, yeah, unless but you're you... going to come out with multiple f- fragrances. That's it, man. It just has another skew. That's, right. It's all good. man. <laughs> It's all good. Do you guys have? Do you guys have a um like a a, a well a, a skew number that um as many as far as how many products you guys want, or do you just want to keep expanding? Um, I don't want too many. I want them all to be driven from a point of intention. And uh, another thing I don't like doing is just copying products that are out there. So I think there's a lot of innovation to be done in this space and improvement. So that's kind of how I'll take it. Is you know if we can add value to this existing alternative, then we'll probably create a product for it. So I don't have any sort of goal, I would say, on a consumer facing front, we just launched into patch technology, which is really exciting. So we're the first to market hydrogel patch technology that you put on a new tattoo, and um, it aids the healing process astronomically. So um, I definitely want to get you guys some if you're planning to get some more tattoos. But that's an I want example. Them, but I'll get one now. If you send me the stuff, I'll go get one. Yeah, it's it's cool, man. It's it, uh, we're producing them out of South Korea, which is the one of the world's most uh, leading and foremost um, skin mask labs, which is really exciting. And like I said, we're just trying to add value and, and help the tattoo consumer in in little ways, right? So if that means cutting down your healing time from 
three and a half weeks to two weeks, that's a big deal to me. Um, Huge. The, the kind of untapped opportunity that remains for us, I think, is uh, continually on the professional side. Uh, we launched our first pro product in February, which is a tattoo glide. For those of you who don't know, it's basically like a smear that the artist uh, rubs in over the tattooing area so that the needle doesn't snag the skin uh, as it's being dragged across. Every tattoo artist uses it in every product. We created the first vegan and natural version for that. So I think there's a lot of opportunity to help really the artist side of the business now, which is really exciting. Um, but yeah, there's there's no number on SKUs. We'll keep going. Hey, Oliver, so, so the, you were talking about the patch. Is that, um, like I've used, uh, like I've used tattoo derm before, which is like that, mm -hmm. it's like that plastic, it, it keeps the tattoo. By the way, I'm a huge fan of these products. You've used them too, right? The tattoo derms? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I yep. love that it goes on. I love that. First off, after one day, it's the ugliest thing you've ever seen, but then you take it off, you wash it, and then you put another one on there. And then literally like three days later, like I felt healed and almost with no pain. There wasn't like the hardest part about getting certainly big tattoos is just keeping them clean, especially in the yep. hairdressing space. You know, in the hairdressing space, it's so hard to keep them clean because there's hair, there's products, there's everything in the air all the time. Um, And um, it, it definitely changed my tattoo ability i guess not ability but you know um to have that patch on there because i just felt clean i didn't feel like i was it was going crazy and that i had to like lube it up every um every couple hours um so is, is that is it is a similar product to that um it's similar so the the big difference is i first of all i totally agree with you it's a fantastic product what it, the most important thing about what it does is it basically skips the scabbing process and scabs are great. If you fall off your bike and scrape your knee, because your body obviously wants a barrier to dirt and bacteria entering the skin. That's why you put petroleum jelly or neurosporin on it because it encourages scab growth. Um, what's great about those second skin products that you're talking about, as well as our soothing gel and our repair patch is it really helps sca skip the scabbing process and it, it skips to more of a flake, which you don't get any of the ink loss when your scabs fall off. Those second skin products, uh, whether it's Saniderm or Derm Shield, again, I, I love them. They work great for me. The biggest complaint about them is that uh, a lot of people are allergic to the adhesive. So when you are too, yeah. yeah, it's very, very common. So when you peel that off, you have like a square patch for a few weeks um, from the reaction. So we're iterating on that. I, I, I want to find a solution that can, that can really replace that because I think it is a great product and it's a great way to heal your tattoos. But where our soothing patch um, is different is instead of leaving it on for up to three days, you're really only leaving these on for eight hours. And then you can, whatever, wash your, your body, let your skin breathe for an hour, and then you can throw another one on before you sleep. So they're a lot more interchangeable. Um, there's no adhesive. It's actually a hydrogel matrix. So what happens is all of the ink and plasma that's seeping out of your tattoo is absorbed into the hydrogel matrix and it bonds that way. And the way you get it off is you saturate it with warm water, which allows the cells to swell, which then releases your skin. So you don't actually have any adhesive per se on your skin. The other benefit that um, our patch provides that those second skins do not is it's a UV resistant up to 98%. So you can actually go in the sun with these, um, which is a huge pain point right now in the summer as, as people are continuing to get you know tattoos and show them off. That's yeah. a conversation. I was going to say, because my daughter, she she got uh, a few tattoos in the fall because she wanted to be out in the sun. What, there's yeah. two things during the summer. It's like, it's, you can't expose, you know, for the first seven days, you can't expose it to salt water and you can't ex expose it to um, like like pool water and the sun, right? So those three variables, it doesn't even make sense. To, the tattoo guys are going to kill me, but it doesn't even make sense to get it in the summer unless you, <laughs> unless you have a, um, you know, a, a better solution for it. Are you guys planning on coming out? You, you have the glide, which is used. Are you guys planning on, or are you working on a replacement for, not replacement, but um, what was called a replacement? A replacement for like green soap? Um, we actually got a ton of feedback specifically at the premier Orlando convention from tattoo artists who came up to the booth and asked for that very product to be replaced. Um, I've heard it's very effective, but it has some serious downsides. So that, for example, is a perfect candidate for something we'd love to, to iterate on. Um, we haven't started yet, but um, it's that kind of opportunity where the artist really likes the form factor and the solution it provides, but maybe has a lot of you know, side effects that, that are un, unliked. So um, that's a good, that's a great example of, of a product that we would consider innovating on.
it's a uh, green soap is alcohol based. So, uh, you know, it always feels good on an open wound. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's spicy. Like, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> but, 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 you know, there's also something to be said like green soap does smell like tattoos. Like, I can't, like, every time I smell green soap, I go, oh, that just kind of reminds me of that whole tattoo experience as well. So, you know, if I, I don't know if fragrance or whatever, but maybe you should have it the same smell because that, uh, that adds to the, uh, <laughs> that, that's the time not to use the vanilla tobacco. <laughs> Yeah, right. You know, that's the fresh smell of green soap. No, <laughs> that's I bought some green soap after my tattoo and I used it. It hurt like hell. So, so I'm curious now that you, that since you're entering uh, the hair industry, the, the hair world, and who, whose idea was to come to Premier? Um, so that was actually a woman we worked with named she was consulting for us. And she basically opened up the opportunity and said, hey, listen, I know this world like the back of my hand. There's a ton of interest here from barbers and salon owners, and um, there might even be a distribution opportunity. So that's what kind of got us in the door at Premier was that that sort of interest. Are you looking for a distribution opportunity? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely open to it. I think a really important thing for Mad Rabbit is for us to control the education and the way that the brand is displayed because our products take so much education. There hasn't been a way to take care of your tattoo outside of petroleum jelly for the last 10,000 years. So like we literally just need to control how our brand is represented on the shelf. So that's like kind of my one aversion to distributors, but at the same time, it also gets you in a ton of doors very fast. So there's pros and cons to it. You, you know, it's, you know, it's interesting to me and it's interesting because the entire industry is moving that way in both salon centric and Cosmoprof, the, you know, the biggest distributors in our, in our, in our, in our world is um, they're now doing um, both, both of them have direct to consumer um, sales. So mm -hmm. um, like we can, we can send a link out. Like if Mad Rabbit was in like, let's say Cosmoprof, um, we can send a link out to our clients and say, Hey, did you, you know, cause we talk about tattoos. Hey, make sure that you pick up this stuff and you can go directly to them as opposed, cause I don't know, like, I don't have enough clients. I don't have enough conversation where I'd want to carry it on my shelves necessarily like mm -hmm. in a salon. But, but if I had, if I had the ability to go direct to consumer and then like, you know, um, um, Oliver cuts me a little check at the end for doing that, like that, that's much more, much more convenient to me than than anything and, and like i said like uh cosmoprof and salon centric now um allows that to happen so that's uh that, that, like kind of like affiliate marketing it's like affiliate marketing but but um you can like if you set up an account with cosmoprof you can um you can now you know you can just send that link to your client and they can they can go directly to the um you know directly from the distributor and that way it never passes through us yeah you know? the other benefit of that is you don't need to shell out money up front to, to stock your shelves right it's yeah and, and that and that's the deal i mean especially tony and i were in a suite you know we only have so much shelf space and like a lot of um i don't know how much you know about the hair industry but a lot of but a lot of the hair product companies like you have to bring in the whole line well you know because mm -hmm. you know we have limited shelf space and like we don't want to shell out three grand for a line you know, um, it, it just it, it, it the the market's changing a little bit. Um, you know, as mm -hmm. far as like where, where where our capital is, and and like if you if we bring in a full line, we'll never make profit off the shelves just because it's just too expensive to bring up and and too expensive to um to upkeep. How big is uh product sales for you? What what percentage of your business would you say is reliant on product sales? Mm -hmm. Um, I, I mean, if I'm being honest, not much. It's not something that that I, I'm really starting to get back into it because there there's direct to consumer. Um, but I'm not interested in filling my shelves with it anymore. Um, you know, the one thing that I realized over over um over COVID was um or th in those days, the one thing that I realized in those days is that the 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 product companies they made us the end consumer, meaning they made the hairstylist the end consumer, and they could care less whether I sold it to my client or not. And then what happened over COVID is that they they all set up like these direct to consumer things, and that's kind of when I realized like, oh, we were their end market, not our clients, right? So then, um, so, anyways, I'm I don't know why I went on that tangent. It, probably because I do every time I get the opportunity. <laughs> Deep seated. <laughs> yeah, yo, it definitely is. Um, but but um, but uh. But yeah, so like I, I you know, I, I want my customer to be the 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 end user and not me, the end user, the end buyer, certainly. But I mean, sure. But it depends on uh, who you, you ask that question. Right. So we we left a company. Well, he asked me. No, I know. But I'm saying <laughs> we left a company that that had 15 salons and they probably averaged 15 to 20 percent. Uh, mm. You know, it's huge. And uh, 
So it, 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 it all depends. And so, you know, there's, there's people out there that they're all about the retail and then you got other people are more, more or less just all about the service, the, the hair and leave it up to the client to, to purchase the retail. Um, so it, it's, it, it varies. Yeah. As an industry. Yeah. Certainly. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, some people, I mean, some people are up to like 50%, right? I mean, like 50%. Wow. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, it's a crazy, especially it's a crazy number to me. Um, not with any judgment, but it's a crazy number to me because the hair services are getting more and more expensive. You know, the average ticket for hair services, I mean, just over the last five years has probably doubled, you know, um, one, it has to, because, you know, products are certainly very expensive for us to bring in now way more expensive than they were, you know, uh, 2020 beginning of 2020, you know, prices just are, I guess with supply chain issues and all that kind of stuff, um, price are going, hey, and I think the, the, the ability and the opportunity for companies to charge more. You know, that, that mm-hmm. does that too, you know, are you, um, are, are you, uh, do, do you get your stuff from, well, you said South Korea, you're getting your patches from, are there, are the products from there as well? Everything is made in the United States outside of that patch technology. That's cool. And are, isn't there like a company in Minneapolis or something that, 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 that does a bunch of uh, the manufacturing? Are you guys using those guys? Um, no, that's not us. We're, we're based out of Los Angeles. Oh yeah, I wanted to ask you about that. So your headquarters is moving to Los. First of all, where's your headquarters? You know now, and and, and it's moving to LA. As of right now, it's my parents' garage in Cleveland, Ohio. Oh yes, uh, we, <laughs> we are upgrading to our first office space ever, which is going to be an arts district downtown LA. Um, the vision for it is it's going to be four or five tattoo beds, heavily content enabled. So. Basically, I want it to be turnkey ready for all of our artists to grow their platform with video, podcast, audio, whatever they want to get into. I want to have all of those assets ready to go. They can grow their platforms and it's powered by Mad Rabbit. So really empowering the artists to grow their community. We obviously get a ton of awesome content as a result. Um, and content's the, the key to Mad Rabbit, right? That's our engine that, that keeps our ads going. That's what provides us content for our social media. Um, content is very much the core of our business. And for the last four or five years, we've done it all out of, um, a studio apartment in Los Angeles. So really excited to have some, some new digs and, uh, a bigger team, quite honestly. Is there going to be like, um, you talked about like the beds there. So will there be like a vent space kind of like incorporated in there? Yeah, that's the goal. I think we're going to do some brand collaboration events, um, throw some parties. Um, we obviously want to be the cool brand and want to bring people into the space, especially as we launch it. So um, that's that's kind of the goal. It's definitely going to be a party friendly space. I love that, man. I love that idea. You know, you uh, I'll give you all fair. I'll give you a couple of hairdressers that uh, that, that that you might want to team up with. Um, awesome yeah that'd be sweet. Like if you did you know not just tattoo artists but even like hair, if you had hairdressers out there like promoting the product or you know talking about it um i'll give you a couple of names and, and they're um the one that i'm thinking of in particular is la based so it might be a good relationship to have um and and as a trusted voice in the industry as well you know? cool let's connect on it yeah yeah let's definitely do that dude so what's so what's next so when's the patch coming out because uh i, I might go get a tattoo now Patch came out two weeks ago. I'll oh. make sure to send you some. Oh, We're good to go. We are live. Um, I I got a uh, my first real American traditional tattoo. It's like this big. It's a black panther, so it's huge. And the reason I got that is I just wanted the biggest, boldest tattoo possible to test these patches myself. Um, and I was blown away with it. So I'm excited for you to try it, dude. I'm so excited. That's where can cool. where can where can people find the patch or find all the patches? Uh, yeah, you can find us on uh, madrabbit.com. We're just about at madrabbit on everything at this point. Um, and I'm Oliver Zach on everything. So happy to connect with anyone in the industry, um, any aspiring business founders, um, and anything in between. But thank you guys so much for having me. Oliver, of dude. course, dude. Thank you, man. Big we fans, were- brother. Yeah, for real. And like, I've been using the Mad Rabbit. You gave me some at Premiere, and uh, I-, I love it, dude. I love it. So actually, uh, Alex, who we work with, he loves her- it so much he didn't share. I don't have any- <laughs> Give me one, man. What do you want to do? We can share a pomade. Fuck, <laughs> you know. Don't <laughs> share. <laughs> don't stop. So, uh, <laughs> but Alex, her her husband Brian, reached out to me and he's like, "I need some of this Mad Rabbit stuff." So uh, I gave him the website. So I, I I hope that uh I hope that Brian uh, uh picks some up. But that's some it it dude. I love it, man. I really, really, and truly, I'm wearing it now, and it feels so good. It feels Thank so you. 
but it's so good. That's Not awesome. My fault. <laughs> Yours is all dry and flaky, dude. <laughs> you should have you should have been in Iceland, Dick. <laughs> you should have been in Orlando. <laughs> Never thought you'd hear that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> exactly exactly that's so crazy what um oh, i had a question about the patch again oh how, does it come on a roll how does it come out no it's um it's packaged in a resealables uh basically ziploc um thing with three patches in it so i went through like three packs which would be nine patches through my healing um one should get you just as far but i really wanted to test them so that's cool. Hey, I, I, actually, before I kick you off, let's go through the product. So you have like you have like what we see all over all, all over um, uh, Instagram, at least is the numbing cream. And then has there, have there been numbing creams out there before? Or, or were you guys kind of the first to the marketplace? No, there's uh, we're, we're like the first um, on label solution for for tattoo numbing cream. Um, people have always used lidocaine for for this, you know, unmarked, if you will. Um, but we're like the first tattoo branded numbing cream. That's kind of where a lot of the product journey starts for a new consumer, especially ones who don't have any tattoos yet, because a lot of times what keeps people from getting tattoos are a, the permanence or b the, the pain. And we can only solve one of those issues. Right. So, um, what we find is that a lot of times the numbing cream purchaser is a first time tattoo getter. Uh, they walk out of the salon with a repair patch on. Um, they'll use those for the first three days of, of their tattoo healing. They'll then graduate to the soothing gel, which is, that's actually our most viral product. It's, it's that little aloe vera based jelly that tattoo artists swipe on new tattoos. Um, that is key for the next two to three weeks. Again, you really don't want your tattoo to get to the scabbing phase because that's where ink loss starts to happen. So, uh, keeping moisturized with the soothing gel. And then that's when you graduate into our unscented lotions and more daily use products like our balm. Um, and then lastly, once you're all healed a month later, um, that's when I would recommend things like the body wash, um, the exfoliating soap, um, that, that kind of realm. So that's what like the full product life cycle looks like. I would say. That's pretty cool. It's, like, it, it, it's, it's not, not inclusive. It's like exclusive or not, you know, big it, it's, it's like, it takes care of every, uh, every bit of your, uh, your tattoo journey. Awesome. Yeah. Can you buy a kit? Can you buy it? Do you have it? A... Yeah, bundles have, have become really big for us, which again gets back to like the concept of going beyond product market fit and into, into brand market fit. Um, there's been so much larger appetite for buying all the products at once. So um, that's something we're working on creating like really nice exclusive boxes for or um, little dop kits, for example. Uh, the consumer definitely wants it. So we're working on it. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, you gave me an overnight bag that I that I switched over and, and I've been using it. And I absolutely, <laughs> I love the like exactly. print, uh, overnight bag, dude. It's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. And they're washable too. You can just throw it in the washer. It's a great, great little. Oh, that's perfect. Jacket. That's perfect yeah. because uh, you know, whenever you have one of those things, your shampoo bottle opens up in it, and you're like, oh, yeah, not a, uh, every time, right? That's cool, Oliver, brother. Again, thanks for hanging out. You know, thank you. Actually, thanks for hanging out with me in uh, in in Orlando and made me feel like a special guy there. We, uh, Oliver, I brought Oliver up to our studio and we we sat and chatted for a little bit. Um, and uh, it, it was cool. And you know, dude, honestly, please reach out if you're going to be at any hair shows. I mean, I, I would love to hang out. Let's uh, let's go let's go do dinner or go hang out or something. Um, and uh, you know, we we we'd love to hang with you. Absolutely. Yeah, let's run a podcast live live next time. Hopefully from Mad Rabbit HQ. Let's do it. We are down. We are down. Cool. We'll LA get your boys tatted. Yeah. We are definitely yeah. down. Mr. Oliver Zach, thank you for hanging out with us and thank you for joining us on you. Awesome. Thank you, gentlemen. Take care. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to help support the podcast, share it with friends. Give us a rating and drop a review. To listen to all the latest podcasts, please subscribe from your favorite podcast outlet. And to stay connected on and off the show, you can follow us at Hair Distry on Instagram and all other social media platforms. Thanks again, and we'll see you next time. Peace and love.